Welcome to the Mutually Amazing Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Damish, with the Center for Respect. The episode you're about to listen to was recorded when this show used to be called The Respect Podcast, so you might hear that mentioned during this episode. Well, let's get to the show. And today we are welcoming a very cool special guest doing amazing work out there. That is Sean Douglas. Now, if you've never met Sean, Sean is a U.S. Air Force veteran, TEDx speaker, master resilience implementer, suicide awareness trainer, performance enhanced expert, and international radio show host and author. His show is is called Life Transformation Radio. And we're going to get right into this. Sean, uh, we wanted to have you on because as you know, this is the Respect Podcast. And a lot of your work relates to that. Particularly, we want to talk about suicide and resilience today. To get started, particularly with that discussion, I think it's really important people hear your story from you instead of me. So you can give people a little background. That'd be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely, man. My background comes from growing up in Detroit, and uh, Detroit, I don't think ever has really been that nice of a place. But my mom and dad divorced when my dad went into the into the Air Force when I was in first grade. And from second grade on to seventh grade, I grew up in an alcohol-dominated domestic violence household. Uh, my stepdad was an abusive towards my mom, my older sister to me, the physical, emotional, mental abuse. It took, takes a toll on you. It really takes a toll on you. And so by the time I was in seventh grade, uh, my mom had had enough. He had gone to jail so many times. Um, the family came and got us. You know, we stayed in my grandparents' basement for like two years until I was a freshman in high school. Went through freshman in high school and then started fighting and getting in trouble and doing a bunch of stupid stuff and was in therapy. And, and then uh, we moved and uh, finished up 10th, 11th, and 12th grade year. I was still getting suspended, started experimenting, started doing other things that just, because I didn't care. I didn't have no purpose. I didn't have any drive. I didn't have any ambition. Half my family was like, oh, poor you guys. The other half was like, you got to live an amazing life. You have an opportunity. Like they were the empowerment people. And by the time that I was 18, I had lived in 11 different houses and attended eight different schools. It was insane. Uh, that prepared me for the military. <laughs> right, right. And prepared me for the military. So at the time, I was like, my life sucks. I don't have any friends. You know, why am I going to make friends? I'm just going to move in a year or two. You know, my third grade year, I went to two different schools my third grade year. This is what happens. So I joined the military and then I found alcohol. And because the drinking age in England is 18 and I'm stationed in England, my first duty station, I was drunk all the time. I didn't have to feel anything. I don't have to do anything. But I was the type of drunk where I was good for a while. And then all of the stuff came up, you know, and all the feelings came up, which made me want to drink more, which drove me deeper. And it was, it was ugly. I was, I was an ugly, I was cool for a while. And then it would just take a sour turn. And so by 2005, uh, I'm in an alcohol and, and drug abuse prevention program with the military. By 2007, my house burned down and I did what everybody does whenever you go through a traumatic experience, uh, you get married. And so I got married in 2007, after my house had burned down, and then in 2008, we got divorced, and then I decided that, you know what, I'm never gonna amount to anything, I'm never gonna be anywhere, so I decided to take my life, and I tried to um, I tried to do that. It wasn't successful, people grabbed me, stopped me, uh, took me to the hospital, you know, they saved me, brought me back, and um, through chaplains, and uh, again, alcohol and drug abuse, classes and all that stuff and people actually taking the time to give value into my life. I then became a drill instructor for the military because I had overcame you know, all this stuff. And that propelled me into speaking and training, which then propelled me into being a resilience trainer, which then I said, this is amazing stuff and it's changing my life. I bet other people can get their lives changed. And so I hit the ground running and now, you know, 10 years, I look back 10 years ago, 10 years ago, me and my wife are fighting, arguing. Uh, I'm drunk all the time. I'm getting yelled at by my boss. I mean, it's it, it's ugly. And uh, 10 years later, you know, I have a show about transformation. I'm a, I'm a master resilience implementer for the military. And I do a lot of work with USO, little veterans, and love what I do, man. Well, you can see that passion in you. And I think what's powerful about your story, Sean, is – you and I, you know, you served in the military. I get to work with the military a lot. 
I don't think people realize how much support systems there are there for people who are struggling. I think people have this perception that our military leaves people abandoned in these moments or just kicks them out and treads. And I think there were times in the past history, we had a recent guest on that that was true of with the topic of sexual assault in his, it was a ways back, but we're in a different place today. Mental health is a priority in the U.S. military and supporting. And your story really highlights that because They didn't give up on you in even multiple situations where there could have been opportunity to say you're out and and we're not getting you help. They kept getting you help. Yeah, I think that you bring up a very good point. I do want to say that in the military, just like there are in any area of life, any job, some people just kind of fall through the cracks because of a crap supervisor. Somebody's like, you know what? I don't want to deal with this guy anymore. I'm just I'm out, you know. There's times where people mess things up, like on the job, and you're like, okay, you're getting reprimanded. Oh, look, you did it again. We're taking a stripe now. Oh, we're taking some rank. We're taking some pay. You know what? You're you're so messed up. You know what? You're out. Bye. Just you suck at this thing. You got to go, right? But in my case, they were like, he's a good worker. Like he's struggling with, with addiction. He's struggling with, with this stuff, you know? And so they had a chance to get me out, but they didn't, and, I, and, I, and I'm thankful for that. I know guys that I've served in the military who ended up with a heroin addiction, and they kicked them guys out of the military, but entered them into a rehab program on the way out the door. You know what I'm saying? Now the veterans, I can't speak on the on the actual like veterans who are in the VA system, like they've been there for years, and like because I'm not in that system right now. Do they get left behind? I can't really speak to that. Everybody wants to think that they do, but I will tell you that you're one thousand percent correct that there are tons of programs out there. The problem is. Pride gets in the way and people just don't want to take advantage of them. I mean, really, if you think about it, you know, there's a lot of things like, well, I don't want to. I'm OK. I'm OK. And they just want to do it on, the, on their own. And sometimes you just can't do it on your own. No, absolutely. And so I, I think it's great that you pointed out that for you, you had those resources. and they didn't, Somebody didn't give up on you. They kept trying. Right. What was the turning point for you? Because you mentioned, you know, you were taking those classes, you're going in those programs and going right back in and right back in. And anybody who has family or friends who have struggled with addiction have seen the roller coaster, right? If they haven't experienced it themselves, they've seen the roller coaster. What was that point that made you go, oh my gosh, what point when you attempted suicide was the turning point of what have I just done? I was in the depths of the hell that I created. You know, like like there wasn't anybody, like when I really look back on it, I created all of the destructive behaviors and self-defeating behaviors. Like that was me. It was, it was me just, I don't want to deal with it. And because that's, that's all, my whole life. That's what was modeled for me. My mom didn't want to talk about the abuse. My sister didn't want to talk about the abuse and she had issues early on in marriage and things like that. But I think what was a tipping point was that I got to the lowest, like I hit rock bottom so hard that I bounced off the rock. You know what I mean? Right. And so In that moment, and and as a suicide awareness trainer, we preach all the time, like, there's a suicide hotline, there's this, there's this, and I teach awareness where if this person is exhibiting this, if this person is exhibiting this, ask them about it, care about them, and escort them somewhere. Ask them to a chaplain, to the hospital, to whatever. Like, don't leave them alone. What I have found, even in in, in my own suicide attempt, was that I masked all my pain and I really didn't want people to know about it. Not because I was embarrassed, it's just, I just, I just, didn't want to deal with it because when you deal with it, then it be, kind of becomes real. Yeah. Brene Brown talks about that, right? What's in the dark can thrive in the dark. When it comes to the light, we can address it and move forward. Right. And, and sometimes I've met people that are like, no, I just, this is where I want to be. I'm like, you want to live like, like what? And they're like, this is what I want to do. I'm like, this is great. Like, how would you want to live at a low level? But that's what their comfort level is at. That's what they know. That's what's been modeled. They've never shown anything different, you know? Yeah. So the tipping point came when I was saved and I was getting some uh, some counseling and some other things like, well, you know, do you have goals? Do you have dreams? I'm like, yeah, but they'll never happen. Like I was such in a negative mindset. And somebody gave me a book by Norman Vincent Peale called The, P- the Power of Positive Thinking. And I read that book and it was like, ding, like there's something to this. Like I like this. And so I started getting into – uh, into personal development, professional development. And then when I became a drill instructor, you have, you're have you forced to operate at a high level. And my accountability partners that I had pushed me when I didn't want to be pushed, <laughs> you know, when I wanted to give up. And so between the literature and the accountability and 
you know, having a brotherhood next to you, you can't fail. Well, that's a great example of teamwork, right? Really yes. being present for each other and challenging each other. And so at what point did you step out of the military? Currently serving still. You are, okay. Three more years. All right, so I think a lot of people were confused because we said you're, it's, and you know, in your bio and all, it says Air Force veteran. And that's where I got confused because I thought, well, wait, I thought he, Sean's still in. So I appreciate you clarifying that, thanks. So you are still. I go back and forth on that because some people are like, well, let's put veteran because you can't represent the, the Air Force. I'm like, well, I'm not representing the Air Force. But like, well, it can be conveyed. I get it. So the Air Force prefers you say veteran so that it's not implying you are right now representing yourself as part of the U.S. Air Force. Yes, correct. And for anybody who's listening or watching, that is true across the board in the military. For instance, uh, you're a speaker, I'm a speaker. No one in leadership can give me an endorsement anywhere in the U.S. military because doing so says the U.S. government's endorsing me and that's a commercial endorsement. For those listeners might remember that a few a couple of years ago, the Trump family, one of them referenced their own products and people, that was a trouble issue because a government cannot endorse a commercial product. Uh, and it's the same for us. And speakers have made that mistake. You can't do it. So I, I get why they do that. So it's just a side note for our listeners, uh, if, yeah. why we can see that. What do you think is key for someone who's in that struggling space? And you see someone who's in that struggling space. What's the best thing you can do for someone? Be there for them and show up with empathy. Emotional intelligence goes a long way. And if you don't know what they talk about EQ, EQI, uh, they talk about emotional intelligence. And what it is literally in its simplest form is showing up with empathy, not sympathy. You know, it's like, it's going to be okay. It's good, but they don't believe that it's going to be okay. So telling them that's just going to piss them off. If you show up and go, you know what? Like my, grand, my grandmother died uh, uh, about a month or two ago, something like that, a month or two ago. And, and that was tough because that's like, like, like when we were going through all that stuff, that's the one person I could just like, she could hold me and I could be in her arms. And I knew that I was safe. You know what I mean? Yeah. And when she passed away, it was like, it was literally, I felt like my childhood died with her because all of my summers, like they have a 10 acre farm, you know, we were out there snapping beans, you know, picking corn. I'm driving the tractor with my grandfather, hammering nails. He had chickens and, and horses. And like, this was like this was where I felt the safest. So when she died, I felt like my childhood died. If somebody told me, it's gonna be okay. I'm like, dude, I know, but I'm mourning my, you know what I mean? If somebody comes to you and says, you know, I, I just recently lost my grandfather or my grandmother or an aunt, or hey, my mom just died too. Cause I had a friend that their parent just, just passed away. And I was like, man, like sucks. And like, yeah, and you connect, right? You connect, you're like, man, it, just sucks like you know what if you live in the memories and you're like yeah that's true like oh my god and you can connect that way you're gonna get farther i promise you you're gonna get farther absolutely true i know we teach audiences all the time one of the worst things you can say to say and i used to make the mistake because i'm known as this high energy positive person so i would be like oh you know it'll be all right it'll be and then i learned a few years back uh i i should have applied what i knew for survivors because for survivors i knew not to do that but I did it in other realms. And you realize that's not connection. That's cheerleading when somebody does not need cheerleading. Uh, and there's a huge difference in when you need it, when you don't need it. And so one thing that we teach people to do all the time is when somebody shares something like that with you, Hey, I lost my grandma. Wow. Thank you for sharing. Because right there, we're like, okay, I'm glad you're able to share that with me. And instead of I'm sorry, which is what people tend to do. Oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry about your loss. Yeah. It, well, what do I do with that? Except tell you it's going to be okay. Like you put it on me now to make you feel better because you seem more distraught. Versus, <laughs> right? It's a weird thing when people do that. And I know it's what everybody teaches, but we, I think what you just said is so important. That sucks. Right? That's a connection point. Well, that sucks, right? Or I really lost my grandpa. Or, how are you feeling? That's sincere. Yeah. How are you yes. feeling? Yeah, how are you feeling? Like, right? I'm feeling great. I'm not feeling, you know, and if they hit you with it, it's going to be better. Like, oh, you had me. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, because even that sucks can work, but it can also be wrong. Like there'll be people like, you know what? Nope, I'm, they're in a better place. It doesn't suck. Uh, versus when we start with, you know, there are people that, that have that experience. They saw, watch somebody in pain for a long time. Answer. So, right, when they say, I lost my grandmother, and you say, wow, that's, thank you for sharing how you feeling. That allows them to say, it sucks. 
And then you can be like, I can only imagine, because you can't say, oh, I know what you're going through, because everybody's different. But I, I can only imagine, or I, I've, you know, I know it sucked when I've lost someone without co-opting their story, obviously. You don't want to make it about you. Yeah, I think this is all important. What about when you are the person? You know, you said, hey, people are trying to help me, and it was, for you is get being given that book. What do you think is key when you are the person, if they're listening right now, that could help them? I reference that sometimes, and I really try not to live in the past, but I think that a lot of our learning and our growth comes from those things that we've overcome. My mindset was just, everything sucks. Like, I always mess things up. When somebody says two toxic things, I call it the toxic two. They say always, never, I never can do anything right. I always mess things up. And they're self-sabotaging or self-defecating or they're self-harming, uh, you know, whatever. Like, I'm so stupid. I always mess things up. I can never do anything right. My life always sucks. Like, when they when they start blaming themselves and using that all or nothing mentality, that is a recipe for disaster. So if you ever hear somebody saying that, you gotta cut them off. The mind, you have to, like I said, you have to get with the mindset that they're in right now. They don't feel like, they don't, they don't believe in themselves. They don't think that there's anything else on the other side. They've hit the wall. They've hit the, they're, they're in the, the depths, right? They're, they're down in the well. So how do you, at that point when they're, hey, my life sucks, everything always bombs, and you don't want to play the, it'll be better because that, that's not going to help. So is that a point of, okay, what are you feeling right now that you're saying that? Is that where you step in there and go, what are you feeling? Because then I can address the feelings. Well, I just bombed this project. Okay, well, that's a project. But you, you also, is that where you do put something positive? But you also did this, had the success a week ago. You, you had four days of work where you got everything done today. And you had a fifth day, you didn't get it done. Is, is that that kind of a approach? Yeah, so, so my approach is that when somebody says that type of thing, like this sucks, I always like, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna quit. Like, this is stupid. This is, you know, I'm like, well, what makes you say that? Like, like what evidence do you have? Like, why do you feel that way? They'll tell me like, well, I always mess this up. I mess up relationships. I mess this up, you know, whatever. I was like, well, well, what's one of the good things that's happened during this process? You know, yeah, you lost your job. You got fired. Um, yeah, you lost your grandmother. Yeah, you, you know, whatever. Like, well, what's positive? Nothing. Come on, man. There's got to be something positive. Like, did you love the job? That, and you kind of just help them along. Did you love the job? Well, no, not really. Well, then you're free of stress, right? You can do anything you want, you know, and you just start adding more positives. Science has proven that gratitude lowers the risk of depression, anxiety, and stress. So if you're like a super anxious person, super depressed, count three blessings a day. And it can be something simple as I am breathing. You are. That's right. You are breathing. I'm alive. You are. You are alive. And so if you're alive, then you have purpose. Well, I don't feel like I have purpose. Well, why don't you think you have purpose? You know, and so you start to kind of be a coach and a friend, but you're using gratitude as the foundation to build them up. And once you can count three blessings a day, it starts steamrolling. And once you start doing that for about 40, 50 days into 60, 70 days, it starts to become a habit. And you start to train your mind to rewire your brain's nervous structure and find the positives. It's, it's proven, science proves that you can actually rewire your brain's nervous system, your nervous structure to actually frame your mind in a certain way and only look through that lens. So where focus goes, energy flows. Focus on the positives, energy becomes positive. You focus on the negatives, you'll only see the negatives. I love it. So Sean, you know, we're all about respect. How do you feel respect plays a role here or, or the person fails to understand respect in this process? Having respect for the relationship, it literally means that, like having respect for the relationship. When I tell people that, like you need to have respect for the relationship. I don't care what my four-year-old says half the time because it's mostly gibberish. But having respect for that relationship means, oh, that's great, honey. That's amazing. Wow. You know what I mean? Like it's showing empathy. It's showing that you care. It's living through your actions. Having respect for somebody means that you come from a servant heart, not a self-serving heart, right? Every conversation doesn't have to be, what are you going to do for me? It doesn't have to be every basis of conversation. But having respect for the relationship shows that you care, you have your empathy, and moreover, that you actually show through your actions these things that we're talking about. 
Well, and I think what you say there is so important because respect the relationship also goes to yourself. Yeah, self-love is huge. Yeah, do you have empathy for yourself? Because a lot of what we're discussing is a failure to have empathy for myself. Pity is not empathy. Right, right. So there can be a lot of self-pity, but not empathy. It's why I tell people, please don't say to people, I'm so sorry, because it comes off as pity. Empathy is, thank you for sharing. How how are you feeling? Then they say, that sucks. Yeah, that does suck. That's empathy. Pity is, oh, I'm so sorry. That, that... Or right, or this kind of thing. That must suck. I, you know, like, like <laughs> your life right. sucks, right? That kind of a thing. Uh, that's pity. And we do it to ourselves a lot of times, especially when someone's in a dark place. They give a great deal of self-pity, but not self-empathy. Everything starts with self-love. During my TED Talk, I talked about how you can't fix what's going on around you until you fix what's going on inside you. You got to fix your heart. You got to fix your mind. And when you can think, feel, and believe in the way that best suits you for success, for positivity, for, right? Then you can start helping other people around you. But a lot of times we don't fix ourselves. I hear all the time with like coaches and mentors and stuff like, I'm so good at coaching this person, but man, I suck at this. Why is it so hard to coach you? Because you don't see it. I'm like, well, take a 10,000 foot view and ask the same questions to yourself that you would ask your your coaches, your mentees, your, you know, whatever. And so it has to start with you, man. And you have to master, self-mastery has to come first before you can start to master other people. Or that's not bad, but you know. I'm no, saying. I understand. <laughs> so, so, helping others. Yes, yeah, supporting yeah, 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 others. Helping others. At, yeah. Yes. Master your profession. How about that? <laughs> yeah. In your life, who do you think helped instill respect in you? Oh, man, that was my grandmother and my grandfather. 100%. 100%. Uh, both actually, I'd say both my grandparents, but just, just thinking around the top of my head, as soon as you said who did, it was like my grandmother, my grandfather. So I remember my grandfather would always tell me, you know, he's like, boy, I tell you what, you know, and every time he'd just shake his head, I'd say something stupid or we'd be out somewhere at a flea market somewhere. I was his thing, go to flea markets. And, uh, and I say something stupid or do something stupid or, or make somebody mad. He goes, boy, I'll tell you what. You know, and he would just shake his head. I knew I'd messed up and I knew I was disappointed. And then he would come across as, here's what needs to happen. And he would just deliver like this life lesson, you know, and I was like, okay, Papa. Okay. And he's like, no, no, really. <laughs> just, it really, it really meant a lot. You know, my grandmother would, she's like, you know, I love you, right? You know, you know, you know, you're loved. You know that, you know, people are here for you. you do you know this? You know, like, yeah, yeah. No, do you know that? Like, she always wanted to make sure so between my both sets of grandparents, you know, they had their way of, and I think that's that's kind of a prerequisite for grandparents, you know, they're not yelling, screaming, carrying out like your like your parents, you know, they're the they're the calm like rationale ones like up on up on mountain high like with this life lesson, you know, that's going to change your life. Yeah, what the, those that is great stories. I love hearing that. And you're right, a lot of people it can be a grandparent, especially like you. You you know, you're very open about I didn't have a great childhood. So to have the grandparents be the voice is, I had a voice. Some people don't have either. So you did have that, which is wonderful. What are you think mistakes people make when talking about suicide? You know, it is in the news more. We're hearing, sadly, more and more celebrity cases. So that keeps it in the news. It's unfortunate that it takes celebrity cases to put it in the news, that case, day-to-day cases don't do the same. But what do you think are mistakes when you hear people reacting to those cases? Like on the general society. Just really what I'm thinking right now is that for the past like three days, I haven't heard Kate Spade's name. So it's like a huge, it's a huge thing. Like for the first three days, it's a huge news story and then it's gone and that's it. So it's, it's cool for a little bit. Right. And I just, I'm like, come on. Like, how do we keep it at the top of mind? Right. You know, how do we, how do we frame this in a way that really, sets the standard to where we need to be looking out for this stuff, you know? And I, I don't really have the answer to that. The only thing I can say is it has to be personal. Somehow it has to be personal, like out of darkness walks, you know, um, USO, Red Cross, veterans, you know, like across the board, veterans and, and, and civilians, that, that there has to be some kind of like monthly awareness. Or there has to be like, you know, something more, going on. More public service announcements more on public TV. Service announcements, something. Yeah, like, Instead of having a commercial for freaking Doritos, why don't we have a commercial for like suicide? You see 
pay me 99 cents a month to foster this child in like Uganda or something like, you know, like you see all that stuff and you see like this pet was left outside, you know, like you see that's why don't we have, you know, why are we not highlighting, you know, human abuse? You know what I mean? Why don't we have a, why don't we have a 30 second commercial about human trafficking? Why don't we have a 30 second commercial about, you know, alcoholism and addiction and suicide because it's, it, cause it's just taboo. It's, it's, it's not a hot topic. Like it's, it's something that we don't talk about at parties. You get all that in the military network. So for those who are not aware, and, and the military net TV stations and the network that the military puts out. AFN, yeah. AFN, that's correct. Uh, AFN, there's no commercials. So what they do to fill in commercials is public service announcements. So you have so much on mental health and sexual violence, and but it's really neat because you know all your, if you're watching TV, you know your resources. There is no way you don't know your resources. Sure. So yeah. that that's a really positive part of that. In a, Sean, what do you think is a book that was life-defining for you? Well, you already, you already named Vincent Peale's Just one. Power of Positive <laughs> Thinking. What would be a second one in addition to that one that you would recommend? Ooh. Gosh, you know, I've read so many mind blowing books and I don't want to give like the think and grow rich and four hour work. We go, I want to get, oh man, the, the one that I absolutely love is the 21 laws of leadership by John Maxwell. Like as a military dude, as a, as a leader, like, man, that's gold. Oh man, that's gold. But as a, like a personal development, like a relationship, like a whatever book recently, the one that comes to mind is the miracle morning. Oh, yes. I love that book. Yes. Oh, my gosh. Like, just reading it, you're like, how do I not know this? <laughs> like, and there's a lot of business books that I was like, oh, my gosh. Right? But, but like life changing books, yep. the ones that I just could not put down, Miracle Morning by far. Yeah. For anyone who's listening or watching, there's a great acronym in there. That you can start your day with SAVERS, S-A-V-E-R-S. But I'm going to make you get the book. If you're listening, because <laughs> we're not going to cheat that way. It's uh, but it's so cool and so powerful. Uh, you have a website called the success cores.com is in military core. So it's the success C O R P S.com. Uh, can you tell everybody what that is? Yeah. So the success core in the next 10 years is going to be the premier entrepreneurship speaker, trainer, podcaster, business owner Academy. It's going to be bigger than Zig Ziglar, bigger than John Maxwell, bigger than Brennan Pritchard. I'm putting it on here right now. You're listening to it here first, 2018. 10 years from now, you're going to see the success score everywhere. You want to be a podcaster, you come learn from us. You want to be an entrepreneur, speaker, business owner, you come learn from us. What it is, is you learn the ins and outs because everybody says get a mentor, get a, but you can't, you can't uh, afford a mentor or whatever. Okay. Well, this is totally affordable because I have coaches from everywhere, mentors from everywhere. And so if you want to, if you want to be one of those those things, you have to join the success core. We unlock your true potential in elevating your life by digging deep into why it is that you want to do. We highlight the why. We then go into those transformational moments that you've had in life that are putting you on this path now. And then we unlock five areas. We unlock wealth and finances, health, personal relationships and development, professional development, like your business, and then spirituality, which has nothing to do with religion, has everything to do with the fact that we're going to strengthen a set of beliefs, principles, and values that you already have. Once you unlock those five areas of life that we all have in common, you can then elevate to the next level. Love it. Thank you so much for joining us, Sean. You've been fantastic. You as well. You should be a podcast host. You've done well. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> and a speaker. I'm there sure you. you'd be great. I'll, I'll give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sean. We'd love to hear your questions, your thoughts, and your ideas. And the best place to leave those with us is on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash mutually amazing podcast. Of course, you can always contact us on our website at mutually amazing podcast.com. Remember to subscribe to the show so you automatically get it every week. And if you could take one moment to leave a review, that really helps other people find the show, which we are greatly appreciative of. So thank you so much for joining us. May you make today and every day a life full of mutually amazing relationships. Mm -hmm.